we unanimously it passed. So we will send this up on to the state and then we'll get word back to you and then let you know for that. But thank you all for that, appreciate it. So Linda, I was gonna read all of this, but maybe you'd like to just get started, would you? <laughs> and Vince was able to get you this skin. So you are in good shape to go, I think. Linda's a Ashland County, Ohio, born and raised. What? How good with this out of the way? Now. <laughs> I knew you all were serious up north here. <laughs> that was a lot of information. Uh, good for you. I heard a lot of things about this club. Uh, very talented. I do go to the Medina Fair, so I have seen a lot of art, good art. So I am so happy that you invited me here. And I hope you gleaned something this evening from my style and uh, the passion I have for art, history, and sharing. And thank you, Ashland folks, for coming to support me. That's fantastic. I also want to thank my husband in the back corner. We've been married for almost 45 years, and I could not do shows without my husband. His partner in the business that we have at Pine Manor, which is our farm. He does custom adding and framing. So uh, sometimes I'm not a big customer, and I have to wait to get my artwork framed up. So um, before I start my PowerPoint this evening, and Thank you, sir, for getting that lined up for me. Since we're all artists in here, I was wondering the success in the art world as a personal and wide ranging as art is. How do you find personal success as an artist? And of course, we all are artists. Maybe it's seeing your work in an exhibition or you have a solo show. That's great. Or maybe it's your face on a news art magazine or American artist when your work is there. Or Sotheby's just sold a million dollar piece of your artwork. Wow. That's what would you say, sir? That's likely to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's wow. But, but let, let, let's come back down to earth just a little bit. For most artists, their dream is simply to support themselves exclusively through selling their art. Finding great homes for your art. That is success. Not always being maybe a, a, a teacher or a waiter like the actors have to do, find other jobs, but to actually make a real living, paying your bills, that electric bill, your phone bill, your mortgage, just being an artist. And selling your work. That is to me a true success of an artist. What was it Andy Warhol said? Oh, we're all going to have 15 minutes of fame in our lifetime. Have you had yours? Sir, have you had yours yet? 15 minutes of fame? Not big enough fame. Not big enough fame. Okay. <laughs> what we need 
mean by how big, but it, it depends. It depends on your definition of fame, I guess. Uh, there are hills and valleys of being an artist. Been there, done that. Many of us have been there and done that. But I will say, on my journey as being an artist, I have been very fortunate. I've had many years of hard work being an artist, and my husband and my sons can verify that. I have worked very hard for years of just being an artist, doing commissions. Yes, I did somebody's cat. Yes, I did somebody's doll. I did a church. I did brochures. I did business cards. And I was very fortunate because one job led to a next, and I thought, how great is this? Being successful and meeting all these new and different people. Um, I brought just two of my portfolios. If you get a chance to come up, take a look. Brochures I designed, people's homes I drew for years, churches. Um, that was fun. I enjoyed that. Did a lot of prints, did a lot of originals, had a great time doing it. Had many art shows where I have been in jury shows. I've won some money, I've won some ribbons. I've been in some magazines. I brought one, I don't know how many of you know, the Ohio, the Heart of Ohio magazine, they did a big spread. I thought that was 15 minutes of fame. I thought that was pretty great. Actually, I think my 15 minutes of fame came when I accepted a teaching job at North Central State College, which in two weeks, after 16 years, I will retire from. I will truly miss my college students. They kept me sharp, they kept me young, they kept me on my toes. And in 2010, I can truly say to Andy Warhol that I made it. I was on a billboard. Oh in 2010, now that's not the fun part. The fun part is, it was in my neighborhood off the of 250, and it was up there for three weeks before I knew it was me. <laughs> that was the fun part. And I didn't know it was me until somebody called me and said, hey, did you know you're on a billboard? I said, what? Yeah, you're on a billboard. It's out there by all these on 250. So my, my youngest son and my husband and I, we got the car and we drove around the block. <laughs> Just to see, I made a billboard representing North Central State College design program. Well, in 2005, I had an exciting thing happen to me and then it crashed. My husband and I thought we started gallery in our hometown of Wildville with a partner. Didn't work out. Partners never work out. It wasn't my husband, it was the other guy. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, it was very successful. Everybody got excited about it. We were excited about it. It was all about art history and education and giving back to our hometown, but it didn't work. So we quick packed up, we came back home, and then all of a sudden another door opens up. And in 2007, the Living History Exhibition began. My reenactors were friends of mine for years. They went to reenactments and they said, Linda, we want you to start drawing us in our regalia. You need to go to these reenactments. Get in with these big artists like David Wright, some of these, the whites that live in Pennsylvania. You're just as good as they are. And I said, I love this. I love this. Yeah, let's get started. 
A lot of my work was developed in 2007 with excitement. One just led to the next and it led to the next. And I thought, this is great. And it started on the road in Mount Vernon Nazarene University. The gallery owner down there said, hey, we want to be the first ones to showcase this. When are you going to get done? I said, I don't know. I just keep working. I just keep working. I want to tell the story. Time period, 1700, 1870, French Indian War, Revolutionary War. I love that time period. Very historical. Not a lot of documentation. My Native Americans are the woodlands. And where's that gentleman? Right there, buddy. He knew it right away. Thank you, sir. So we started and opened up down there. It was very successful. We had lots and lots of people. My reenactors, I have to give them credit. I have five of them to travel with me, dressed in their regalia. And they have researched original diary entries that goes with the artwork. And I'll read a couple of the diaries with the artwork. And what is ironic about that is I did the artwork and they found the quotes that went exactly with my illustrations. That's the educational part of it for the students, also for adults. So I want people to look at my portraits as a moment of historical contemplation where we can look back and give recognition to those who have come before us. That is blue eyes. I brought four originals tonight with me, kind of four of my favorites to share with you. These are some of the <coughs> openings. There's the reenactors. Every picture of this is in a different location. We've got uh, the Arts Castle in Delaware. How many people have been there? Yeah, it's a great place. Um, Worcester, the library, Friends of the Library sponsored it, and I was there. Um, Ashland University, and I was there. I was down in Wellington. There is there. I was in Worthington for that one. Next. Um, all these are my photographs. Uh, it kind of gives you what the, the deep Ohio was in that time frame. This is the Cumberland Gap. Gorgeous. Martin Station is down there. That's a fantastic uh, fort. And the Cumberland Gap is where three states come together. Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Can you imagine that? <laughs> You're standing in three states. I got so excited. <laughs> so Kentucky, Daniel Boone is territory. Next, this is called The Crossing. Uh, this is Lee McBee. He's a retired uh, history teacher from Jeromesville, Ohio, and that is his son and his two daughters. And I gave that to them as a gift uh, for the original, so it is no longer traveling with the exhibit. But uh, he was just thrilled to death to have that piece. And you can see the Ohio Valley, the woods were dark and scary, and they would go across paths carrying only what they could carry over the Appalachian Mountains. Next. Constant companion on this side. Again, it's Lee. I brought on the banks of the Clear Fork of the Mohican is the original. And I would like to say a few words about that. That is definitely one of my favorites. This photograph 
was a photo shoot down at Mohegan well, State Park. How many have been there? Okay, this is just below the covered bridge at Mohegan. Well, there is an area that you can walk out on the water and you've got just the rock area there. And I did a photo shoot there. I'm standing out in the water, taking different pictures of Lee, and he's doing different <coughs> things. And finally, when he gets to this position, I got very excited, and I said, that's what I want right there. <laughs> and the landscape, you help to see the subject in the abstract. When you look at the original, the background of the, of the uh, bushes it's just abstract. It's just different shapes and patterns. It's a lot more loose. You think patterns, texture, and you think values. Water can challenge the artist. But at the same time, it can tune in your skills. Let me tell you. Seeing the water interacting with the land. And you'll see that when you come over and take a look at that original. Um, I had more fun doing all of the rocks and then going back in. One of the secrets when you put in the reflections of the water, you've got a value in there. You take my favorite kneaded eraser. Who, who loves their kneaded eraser? You take your kneaded eraser and you lift up. You lift up the values and you've got that reflection of those logs. I love it. And then if you got too much values in there, you start making the waves for the water. The abstract composition across the bay is the deep, dark Ohio forest. The shapes are what's important. And when you get a closer look at Lee, Nature and water come together. He's got all of his regalia on, and if you look real close, the objects that are crackled and cured leather, the age of an object, you try to achieve that with that detail, and that's values. If you look in his eye, he's on alert. It's accurate, but it's not forced. Take a look at that at the end of the evening. Don't everybody fight to get over there quick. <laughs> okay. So, an eye. If you struggle with an eye, this is what I tell my college students. If you struggle with an eye, get the shape of the eye. You can't get it. Draw the shape between the eye and the brow works every time, works every time. They're totally amazed by that, totally amazed by that. Let me read that quote that goes with that because it is exceptional. On the banks of the Queer Fork of the Mohican, set him in the midst of a boundless forest, a thousand miles from an inhabited he is by no means at a loss, nor in the smallest degree dismayed. With his rifle, he procures his substance. With his tomahawk, he erects his shelter. He drinks at the crystal spring or the nearest brook. His wants are all easily supplied. He is contented. He is happy. This came from J.F.D. Smythe, the tour of the United States of America, <coughs> early 1770s. <coughs> Next. Oh, this is Jack. Jack is tracking. Jack Johnson he is a militia officer. And this is a great quote of his, too. Make sure I have that with me. Tracking. The whole business of the hunter consists of a succession of intergroups. From morning till night, he was on alert to gain the wide, the wide of game, a 
approach them without being discovered. Joseph Dobson notes on the settlement in Indian Wars of the western part of Virginia and Pennsylvania from 1763 to 1783. Next. Native American villages. Down in Springfield, Ohio, we have the George Rogers Clark Park. The biggest Ohio battle was fought there. The Battle of Pickle. If you ever get a chance to get down there, you need to see that. Every year in September, they have a weekend battle. It is jury village. Everything is authentic. Food, clothing, everything. It just takes you back in history. And it, they can't get in unless they're all completely jury. It's all real. The Battle of Pitbull. Next. This is called a welcome shelter. You know, we talk about um, a, a wigwam. I know it's kids a lot, students, elementary students, they think of teepees. We had the wigwam, Native Americans here in the woodlands. So we talk about how they were made, put together. Um, so this is called a welcome shelter. Next. Yes. Once there were millions, we list every part of the Native American buffalo that was used. The kids can't believe it, but we talk about that. Once there were millions. Next. You're doing so well, by the way. <laughs> this is my largest piece. And this is my favorite, but my husband doesn't like to carry this, so we need this at home. It's called the adversary. The total size is 50 times 41 inches. And a lot of the Ashland folks have seen this, so they know how big it is. That's four feet, two inches by three feet, five inches, in case some of you were trying to do the math. Um, this is Blue Eyes, okay? This is his rifle. And if you look at the point and you go right down the barrel, it's taking you right to him, which is the main focus. He is in a triangle. If you take a look at all my these, I don't know how many there are, but there's a lot. They're all pointing. To him. And I did make a mistake in this on the first few minutes. I went way dark and heavy over here. And I thought, this is too dark and heavy. Yes, the Ohio woods was very dark and scary, but that's way too dark. So I took this original over to my drafting table at college and I started taking many of my different types of erasers showing my students you can never make a mistake and i started lifting all of this up for these trees here at the end and it balanced out what do you think <laughs> it would have been too heavy too heavy on the one side so i i had to do something about it and i thought you know if i don't spray Unless I want it really deep, dark, and rich, then I can spray it, you know, a workable fix dip and work over top of that. But uh, so, yeah, it came out so much better, and I'm so happy I did that. Next, oh, Michael Tallbear. Michael Tallbear. And I have a gift for everybody if I think I brought enough. Right here. Uh, this is when the exhibition was at Ashland University at Coburn Gallery. And the Tanson paper is the little squares in his shirt. It's not a color of his shirt, it's the paper. So take a look at that. That's negative and positive shapes. Why do I have 
is this all? You can't ask questions right now. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is all pencil. Yes. Okay. Yes, I work with uh, 12 different pencils. Okay. Mm -hmm. Value scales. And, uh, and then the color pieces are pastels okay. and color pencil. You'll see, you'll see up close over there a couple of the originals. So be sure you get um, you be sure you get that. He's a Cherokee mixed blood. He's wearing a linen English made trade shirt in the 18th century. Uh, lots of Indians in the Ohio country at that time period were wearing French and English military clothing. They took them off the dead soldiers. <laughs> Next. This is called Proud Warrior. This is all pastels. Next, this is the Sentinel. This is one of my favorites too. Um, my name is Charles. I am from Virginia. I am a long hunter scout for Martin Station. The time is around 1767. My rifle is a 54 caliber Virginia rifle. I have my powder horn and leather powder bag on my sash around my waist is strapped a pull tomahawk and knife. My shirt is linen. My long waistcoat is bright brain tan deer as are my leggings. My moccasins are hand sewn elk hide. And this is from my interview with this gentleman at Martin Station. And he is a retired school teacher who goes to the jury reenactments. Great guy. And of course, if you look closely, Martin Station, the fort, is inside, and they always had a sentinel on guard. And of course, what do they always have with them? Their rifle. Next. Here's Martin Station. Martin's Fort was on Martin's Creek. The fort was located on the north side of the creek. There are some five or six cabins. These were built some 20 feet apart with strong stockade between. In these stockades, there were portholes. The station contained about a half acre of ground. The shape was a parallelogram. There were two fine springs near the station, which afforded plenty of water. The woodland came near the station on its north side, Martin Station was at 18 miles from the Cumberland Gap. This is from Captain John Reed's Western Virginia, 1755. If you, I didn't bring this original, but I had to find you in all these guys' faces. They're all, all the detail is there. I had fun doing that. Sometimes I have problems knowing when to quit. Who else has that problem? <laughs> Margaret, I know you do. I've seen your work. No, I, sometimes I have, you know, sometimes less is more. I try to do like 80%, <coughs> maybe 85%. But sometimes I never know for sure when to stop. And then I'll rework it sometimes. And sometimes when they're framed up, I want to rework it, but my husband won't take them apart. So I make them darker some places. Next. Okay, the red coats. I had fun doing the red coats. Uh, we talked about to the school's children. Well, why were those coats red? What were the reason the British had red coats? Sir, you should know. Do you know? You don't know? 
Well, during the battles, if they got shot, it's red blood. They wanted the British to just keep working and blend right into their jackets. That's for sure. Yeah. So you can see from the drawings, you've got a couple that are loading their gun. He's got the paper in his mouth. Third gentleman down. And of course, this is the British six pounder. And most of those students that we've been in to schools know those days, which I'm very happy about. So that it wasn't to make a good target, is that it? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> For who? <laughs> ah! For who? Okay, but this was the Battle of Bushy Run, by the way, Battle of Bushy Run, and that was uh, 1763. Next. So we've been many places with the exhibition. I've been very fortunate. I get paid by grants. I thank the teachers who spend a lot of time. In fact, we have one teacher in the back who wrote the grant, and I was to the elementary school where she taught. She's retired now. And uh, I can pay my reenactors, and I also get paid. So I have never been turned down by a grant from Martha Holding Jennings Foundation, from the PTO, from wherever else they can gather up from the foundation. Uh, we're not that expensive, but I do appreciate my reenactors, so I want to make sure that you know, they get paid for their time and, 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 you know, bringing history alive because I couldn't do it without them. I mean, we're a group. So I have done workshops. Uh, Blue Eyes has come with me as a model. I demoed for, for uh, different clubs and groups and things like that. So that's basically what that is. Next. Now the educational journey. This is what this is what is so nice. Uh, the kids are so well behaved. Every place we've been, they get so excited about seeing all the stuff the reenactors carry with them, uh, the stories they tell. Um, we, we have games that they go around and look and find different things in my art and, and record that and write it down. And the teachers always say to me, you know, these kids are so well behaved. Could you come back every day? <laughs> but the thing of it is, you know, we're bringing history alive. We're not, they're not reading it in a book. And we're giving them some real important stuff. So, you know, we, we've gone through a lot of places and we've had a lot of fun with it. And my journey is still going. I, I just finished the piece. Um, I didn't bring my one. It's the newest. This is the next to newest. Uh, this is a French fur trader, Courier de Boss. This is a picture, my reference of him. This is a note card. Um, and that's, that's won me some money. It's been in a couple jury shows. It sits in my living room. Probably one of my favorite pieces. Next. All right, this is some more places we've been in schools. I have a music gentleman, two of them. Uh, they talk about the instruments, they play the instruments. Uh, flint napping, I have a flint napper. Uh, Roger Moore. Roger is from the Melungeon tribe in Virginia. He's the only one left. And he's been very famous. He's been in a lot of PBS movies and things. And this is, again, Blue Eyes. Next. Now, you do have to see some of these wonderful drawings by students. They're in the books up here. Their interpretations of blue eyes are unbelievable. <laughs> They're just out of this world. Next. Look at them. I mean, I could have done six or seven pictures of just the kids 
interpretations of blue eyes. You know, he talks to them, tells them what he has on history wise and so forth. I'm going around helping the students draw, looking at him. Everybody's sitting at different angles, different perspective. Uh, we have different materials that we use. God, it's just so, so exciting what they come up with. And they would say, I got to be careful. They said, I want to get as good as you are. I said, well, keep working at it. Keep looking at him. You'll get it. Go over there, look at my original, then go look at him, then come back to your paper. That's magic. Oh, and by the way, that is Taft, that is Peg Stover's school right there, putting her on the spot. Next. All right. Uh, some gallery settings where we've been at. We live in an 1839 farmhouse. We have antiques. Real easy for me to gather up this period of things that they used in that time period. I take it and I have two tables like this. We have pelts. Kids can touch the pelts. They can touch the wooden bowls, the crocks, the boxes, everything. So that's a sample, small sample. I think there's another one next. <clears throat> right here. Um, they're all on display, and, and we let the students touch everything because that's part of the learning experience. They can, they can touch all this stuff. Uh, look, so you even have adults touching the guns. <laughs> Next. There we go. That's a closer look. Um, and you can see some more of my pieces that relate to the different things. Uh, tobacco. I stopped in Virginia once on our way home from uh, from Tennessee, seeing our son, and we went to a tobacco farm. And they went out to the barn and got me tobacco, and I still have it. It's a little dried out, but you spray it with water and it comes back. That photograph I took of the barn where the tobacco was hanging. The gentleman says, would you want it out in the field? We'll cut it for you. Or do you want it dried in the bar? I said, well, I'd like dried. So they went out and got it for me. So we take that and the smell is just as sweet as it can be. And you know how important the tobacco and the fields were back then? Very important, very important. Next, all right. Children learn by doing, by touching, by experimenting, choosing, talking, negotiating. Active manipulation of the environment is essential for children to construct knowledge. On duty, democracy, and education. This teacher resource book was put together and paid for by the Honda Corporation for me to go to Delaware, to the Arts Castle, and they bust in four busloads of students. This is a teacher resource packet. Take a look at that. That was a lot of work put together, and I have since every school I have been to, we have copied this. There's all kinds of games in here. There's math projects. There's about Native Americans, all kinds of things that is part of the educational package long after I leave school that day. Well, this has been a journey. It continues on. I don't know how much longer it will go or where it all will go. You all know about COVID, so we took a break. I ran after took a break. I took a break. <clears throat> I lectured for two years for mask. They just recently lifted that. Um, so maybe next year, we'll start booking it again. But it pretty much sells itself with the help of my reenactors. So I graciously thank you for inviting me 
And I had a great evening tonight. I hope you did. And I thank you for getting the PowerPoint going to go. That's your IT guy right there. <laughs> Um, is there any questions? You can ask questions now. Yeah. Um, the gentleman that was the last Indian, what, it, like, what do you mean he's the last Indian? When he dies, there's no more. Yes. Yeah. It's from his moment. tribe, the Lynchian tribe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You see him at some point, you ask him, he'll tell you all about it. He's the good storyteller. Yeah, he's got a lot of history behind him. He's like 90%. Wow. So do you work vertically or flat? And I work any way that works. <laughs> How do you not smudge all your... Um, I have three C paper here. Okay, I'm on YouTube. There is a documentary that one of my students in 2015 I have dark hair, not this now, <laughs> but it's me, 2015, I think he did it. Um, if you just put in Linda McFarland, YouTube, Linda McFarland, and you go down through, I'm on several times, but go to the country artist. It's about a five minute documentary. I'm working on that piece. And I teach the college students how to use tracing paper and lay their hand down as they're working whether it's charcoal or pencil, so you're not smearing. And it's tracing paper you can see through. So you can see if you want to go back up here and work this, but you've already worked this down here, you can go see where you're, where you're heading. If I'm working pastels, I have worked kind of up and down with the sheet down here and you know kind of get into it. Um, here, there's three things here for you. This is my artist statement. Um, Claude, Claude Monet, you don't know Claude, right? Not personally, Mark, but do you know him personally? Uh, I'm gonna, you can hit her with that cane if you want, Mark. I've known Margaret for a long time. We go way back. I'm so happy to see her. I, I knew she belonged to this group. I'm just happy she came tonight. Okay. I made it close. So my students, if you ask any of my college students, she knows quotes. Here's a quote. It's on the strength of observation and reflection that one finds a way. So we must dig, divide, and unceasingly look. Andrew Wyatt, my favorite artist, or any of the Wyatt family. One of my favorite parts is the master of creating that mood and illusion that he does. You've got to see with your eyes. Artists see differently. You teach students how to see. Look again, you didn't see. Look again. Art is not what you do, it's who you are. That's a quote by Andy. There's also a sheet up here to take this uh, list of my materials that I use for the Living History Exhibition. Uh, I give 16 postcards to all the teachers in the elementary schools that the kids can pass around and talk about images. I brought the 16 here to show you what they are. I brought you a brochure in case you know of anybody that would like to book it, okay? And in case you want to come to Pine Manor sometime and head down south, you're more than welcome. Just give us a call and we'll give you a tour. And that's a map how to get there and our business card. And both my husband and I look a little bit younger in this than we do tonight. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. I only do one drawing at a time, one job at a time, and I, if I get excited about it, I'll just work on that, and I work on that two days, three days, four days till it's done. Yeah, I know a lot of artists, maybe somebody in here, they 
do a piece and then they'll set it off to the side and then they'll start another one and then they'll go back to that one or you know sometimes paintings would do that i have never done that i don't know i couldn't be get that finished did you ever get discouraged that you start from the same well i'll tell you well, then you go to the bathroom or you get a cup of coffee. <laughs> or you leave the room because when you come back, you have fresh eyes and you can see where you're going. And you can salvage it most times. If you feel that it's just too far gone, I would just start fresh and it wouldn't be that day, it would be another day. Blue eyes over there, I can't believe I hit him. Honestly. That is a deep gray cancer paper. I never used it before, but I felt it was calling me. I am not a great person with color and pastels. You give me my pencils and my values and I'm good. But that that's going out on a limb for McFarland. That you can ask anybody that knows me real well. I, yeah, I, uh, I don't think I could do that again. I don't think I could do him again. Well, thank you. I appreciate hearing that. Every artist appreciates hearing that, you know? <laughs> we all should say to each other, turn to each other and say, you do great work. <laughs> do that! Do that! Do that! You do great work! You do great work! By the way, Nancy Redmond is my next door neighbor here. And What's your sister's name, Nancy? If you guys didn't behave tonight, she's going to tell on you. <laughs> Any other questions? Please feel free to come up and take this free stuff. Um, look at look at uh, some of my albums here, of some of the places we've been, and. Again, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the evening as much as I did.